All right. We're on page 48, talking about Charles Darwin, who, again, together with Hegel, has had a, an enormous influence on modern thinking. If you, if you say, I don't believe in evolution today, you're a nut. People gasp and, and bug their eyes out at you as if you're some kind of a, an idiot or a nut. So Darwin, this is the middle of the page, Darwin never said that this process was responsible for the origin of life. He did not deny creation. Nonetheless, Darwin was a materialist. According to him, the interpretation of dreams, hallucinations of the imagination, and other similar phenomena gave man the idea of spirits, which in turn served as a premise for the idea of God. See, so first human beings thought of spirits, and then there's a great spirit. You see. The moral law, which implies an essential distinction between vice and virtue, good and evil, is a simple transformation of the social instinct of animals, because they're very moral beings, brought about by natural selection. You know, they observe property rights as when the hyenas come and try to take away the, the carcass of the, the wildebeest from the lions. You know, there's, they observe that the lions kill the wildebeest and, and that, the, you know, they're very, very observant of the moral law. The same may be said of man's sense of duty. It's all from animals. Dar <laughs> Darwin's basis for the establishment of the origin of man from monkeys is the variability of man in his corporeal form and in his mental faculties, a variability which is able to be transmitted by heredity. In order to know if man is a descendant from monkeys, modified from a pre-existing form, it is necessary to verify above all if, it, if he varies even a little bit in his corporeal form and in his mental faculties, and to verify if this is so and if these variations are transmitted to his descendants according to the laws that prevail in the inferior animals. In other words, because that's incomprehensible. It is sufficient as a proof of evolution of species to determine if there have been some variations which are able to be transmitted to offspring. That's a proof of evolution. If some variations can be transmitted to offspring. Evolution of species, not of variation within the species, but evolution of species. For Darwin, there is no need to determine if these varying characteristics are sufficient to constitute a new species. Any transmissible variation is sufficient. Based on this fundamental principle, Darwin says, by going back as much as possible in the genealogy of the kingdom of vertebrates, we find that the first born among them probably belong to a group of marine animals, similar to the larvae of the uh, ascidians, the tadpoles, which we know today. So we all go back to the tadpoles. That means frog larvae. These animals probably produce a group of fish, probably, you know, it's science, of fish with an organization as low as that of the amphioxy, something like a sponge, this group must have produced, must have, that's science for you, must have produced ganodei, fish like sturgeons that produce caviar in Russia, fish which are certainly only slightly inferior to the amphibians. Among the mammals, one easily imagines one of the degrees which lead to the ancient monotremes for example, the platypus, to the marsupials, for example, the kangaroo, and the latter to the ancestors of the placentoid mammals. 
We th thus we arrive at the lemurids, at the lemurs, animals, something like monkeys, which are found separated from the simians by a small interval. The simians are divided into two great trunks, into the monkeys of the new world and the monkeys of the old world. From these latter, but at a very distant time, man descended the marvel and glory of the universe. That's his science. That's going from the tadpoles right up to human beings, wham, in one paragraph, with the probablys and the must-haves and imagines. I mean, this is what we're supposed to accept. Critique of Darwin. From the foregoing, it is clear that Darwin is a materialist. That's very important. For him, there is a new species, a new and higher form of life, if there is any transmissible variation. So variation in color, variation in the size of a beak, or uh, any, anything at all, you have a new species. That's the first mistake. So for example... There was a case in London where the moths, uh, because they lived in the area of Birmingham or one of those big, Manchester, one of those big smokestack uh, cities of England, turned black. I mean, they started to, to reproduce in black because the trees were blackened by the smoke of the... Of the uh, I mean, that could happen. You see, it probably does have it. That's not a change in species, though. But for him, that's a, oh, that's a new species. So that's the first thing, is, is species is, is uh, the essence of a thing. Species means image. So species, the, the image of the essence is a species. So you're really referring to essence. So essence is what the thing is. It answers the question, what the thing is. A moth is a moth. No matter what color it is, it's a moth. All right. Thus, if an insect were, according owing to a new environment, what I just said, to change the color of its wings, for Darwin this would be a new and higher species. That that's a very grave error. Thus, the most fundamental criticism of Darwin is that of his materialism in general, because in materialism, there is no essence, there's no form, it's just all stuff. So if you have new stuff, you have a new species. There's no essence. Which denies the fundamental distinction between substance and accident, matter and substantial form. Materialism, which is as old as the ancient Greeks, is a totally unacceptable system since it fails to provide an adequate explanation for the real difference between things as well as for the notion of change. Because in all change, there is something that remains the same and something that differs because something changes. And that was the breakthrough of Aristotle with, with matter and form act and potency, because the Greeks up to that time were either siding with one or the other. In other words, everything is one, that's siding with form, and everything is many, that's siding with matter. Because they couldn't figure out how change occurred, and, and Aristotle's philosophical breakthrough was act and potency, which translates into matter and form in, in physical things. So, I mean, it's as old as, you know, the Parthenon, you know, <laughs> Helen of Troy and those things, you know. <laughs> Darwin also tends toward atheism, and there is really no logical reason why he should not have asserted it. For him, God is the product of our dreams and imagination, as we said. Our religious sentiments and our moral d duties are merely the transformations of beastly instincts. You see, because they're very religious. 
those animals. Uh, you can see they're on their knees praying. And they have uh, a lot of morality, as I said. You can see them, you know, killing their enemies and whatnot. I saw a picture yesterday of an eagle flying off with somebody's pet cat. A big one, too, an adult cat. Yeah. I really don't know. There's plenty of them around here, though, you know. But, uh, Whether it be the man of science or of holiness, the man endowed with liberty or reason, for Darwin he is nothing but a perfected ape. Which makes no sense at all. You know, somebody might say, well, apes look something like human beings. Well, it's true in all creation that there is a, a gradation as you go up, in other words, that the there it is you see certain beings that look like beings that are ahead of them. In other words, that are higher than them. That's creation. So it stands to reason that God would have created certain beings that look something like human beings and act something like human beings. But that's true of all creation. All creation has a gradation, and, and uh, you see a, a similarity from one to the other. So it would be expected, even if they were, had never been discovered, you would expect that from the general gradation of creation. And there are major differences between apes and human beings. They have arms down to their feet practically. And they're they're they have, you know, nothing for a brain and uh, all sorts of other different aspects. I mean they're quite different. And besides that, for God, there is no difference between making a human being from an ape and making him from the slime of the earth. Absolutely no difference. Because he would have to transform the entire matter of the ape into the matter of a human being, just as he would have to transform the entire matter of slime into the matter of a human being. For him, that's equal. You can't make it a, a, a human being out of an ape. You can't... In, in, infuse an immortal soul into an ape and call him a human being. That's impossible. The matter is not conformed to the, to, the, to the form. It just isn't. Any more than you could put a, a, a round peg in a square, square hole. So, it, you know, God doesn't need an ape in order to make a human being. He doesn't even need slime in order to make a human being. He probably made us from slime in order to humiliate us. So I, I think it's definable that God made man from slime. I, if I were the Pope, I would define that. I don't think I'll be elected Pope anytime soon. But I would define that as a dogma, that man was made from the slime of the earth, as it says in Genesis. But anyway, that would make talk about people going berserk, and I would love every minute of it. Yes. Well, it's in sacred scripture. I don't see how you could deny it because it's in sacred scripture. It's at least de fide. It would seem to me de fide. That means it's not... It, it, I don't think the church ever, def ever, you know, made it a dogma in a council, or but it's in sacred scripture. Whatever is in sacred scripture is de fide. I don't see how you avoid that. 
It's very clear. <laughs> he made him from the slime of the earth. <laughs> I don't see how you could possibly say, without contradicting Genesis, that he, that he made him from a gorilla. Otherwise, it would say that he made him from a gorilla. I mean, if, if somebody have an explanation for that? <laughs> so, we'll see. But anyway, uh, the history of Darwinism has also proven the atheistic penchant of his philosophy, of this philosophy. E evolutionism has always been the delight of the enemies of the Catholic Church, for it destroys the notion of creation. But creation is the basis of the most fundamental religious principle, even of natural religion, and that is the dependence of the creature upon the creator. The reason why primitive peoples offer sacrifices to their gods is because of that. Those, even, the, even the most distorted of natural religions has that as its basis. If you wreck that, you wreck all religion, and they understood that. If you make human beings just a glorified ape, religion goes down the tubes. All of it. So all religion, even natural religion, is based on this most fundamental dogma and concept. But even apart from these considerations, it is clear that Darwin's system lacks foundation. It rests on the assumption that there is an original protoplasm or life form which no one has ever seen. It appears out of nowhere. It appears in that amino acid mud puddle that is being struck by lightning. If all life proceeds from this original cell, then we must conclude that every li everything every living thing that should be, every living thing, whether vegetal or animal or human, is essentially the same thing. Another gratuitous principle is that of natural selection as efficient and sufficient cause of the production of species. <clears throat> For even if one admits the gratuitous original cell, there is no reason to say that natural selection is the efficient and sufficient cause of all the species of plants and animals, given their essential differences, both which are profound and radical. we'd have to say then that the only difference between a snake and a cow is material. It's like the only difference between this ceramic cup and that ceramic cup is material. That it's made out of different matter. But they're the same thing. Or this brick and that brick. So he, he presumes this, that natural selection is going to make this, this immense diversity of creatures, immense, with all sorts of different characteristics and habits of acting. In other words, <clears throat> uh, consistent acting. <clears throat> Snakes are always going to slither. You know, cats act always the same way. Dogs act always the same way. Lions, everything, they all act in the same way. There has to be a sufficient reason for they're all acting in the same way and not merely matter. It would be the equivalent of explaining a triangle in this manner. Originally, there was a point. 
By virtue of natural selection, the point transformed itself into a line. Then, by natural selection, the line turned into an angle, and then by the same process into a triangle. <clears throat> It's the same thing. How does a, a point become a line all of a sudden? How does it turn the corner and become an angle? And how do you get three angles? <clears throat> Why does the original point turn into a line and not into an elephant? According to the system of the evolutionists, there is as much reason why it should turn into a line as into an elephant. In other words, Darwin's system denies the principle of sufficient reason. That everything that exists must have a sufficient reason for existence. In other words, it has to have a cause which contains that very effect in itself. It is true that natural selection can produce some variations, that is, qualities or perfections which are more or less important within the same species, so color, etc. But to change species involves the cor corruption of the substance and the beginning of a new substance. So to change a frog into a prince, or a prince into a frog. Adaptations to environment are not sufficient to corrupt a whole substance. In fact, the very notion of adaptation presupposes something which is adapting. Some basic thing which is taking on a new accident, adapting to something. That is a substance, a nature, which is receiving a new accident. Furthermore, even to explain these adaptations, it is necessary to posit a cause in the plant or animal itself which is productive of these adaptations. So you have to have some sort of ability to adapt <clears throat> to change color or to, to do something. You have to have a power within yourself to adapt to these things. Otherwise, there's no sufficient cause even for accidental adaptation. Thus, we would have to say that these adaptations are already virtually in the plant or animal, that is, in causa, and need only to be activated by an exterior occasional cause. So, uh, like the, the dirt on the trees in Manchester, England. <clears throat> so there is obviously some ability in animals to adapt to their environments and that's why you have various species of birds etc in certain forests i mean it, it's clear that you do <clears throat> and so it's normal to conclude that there are mechanisms of adapt adaptation in animals but that's not what Darwin is talking about. In this way, the oak tree is essentially but virtually in the acorn. In other words, when an acorn is placed in certain conditions of heat and water, it will develop into an oak tree. So also when certain life forms are placed in varying environments, they have the power to adapt to these environments and to pass on these adaptations to their offspring. <clears throat> Even plants will adapt to environment. But this is not evolution in the Darwinian sense, but rather the attestation of the perfection of the nature which the Creator created. He put those Ad adaptive principles in those things so that they would survive in changing circumstances. <clears throat> 
A thousand accidental adaptations do not equal a single essential change. Just like, as Garigou says, a thousand idiots do not equal one genius. <clears throat> Furthermore, Darwin is guilty of incomplete inductions, of insufficient analysis, and of illegitimate generalizations, as we saw. He, he sees a few examples. Oh, then this must be the, 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 the law. Which is not science. One sees in his system that he started out with a priori, the, an a priori assumption of evolution, which he got from Hegel and all of those other people, and looked anxiously in nature for proofs of it, which is a very bad way to do science, any science, and particularly theological science. You don't never do outcome-oriented theology. All right? I need a conclusion. Or any science. I like this conclusion. I, you know, it serves my purpose. Let me find a proof for it. You're almost certainly going to make a mistake. You have to go in and look at the evidence very clearly and objectively and draw whatever conclusions they demand. But he's guilty of outcome-oriented uh, science. In addition, the paleo paleontological evidence does not uphold Darwin's theory. For there are many fossils which are found which look identical or nearly identical to modern species. Like these fish that they find, they look exactly the same as the fish that they are today, which would not be possible in his system. Even though they are purported to be millions of years old, horseshoe crabs look like the same horseshoe crabs that you see washing up on the beach in the Atlantic Ocean. I don't know what you call that in your various languages, but I'd have to show you a picture of one. I, I won't even try. Well, maybe I could. I have my phone on there. Horseshoe crab. But that, that's a very typical example. But they, they find all these fossils. Let's see. I won't even try in Polish. <laughs> well, that's not that important anyway. But yeah, the uh, let's see, Google Translate. Not with that. Enter the sign. Enter text. This will be from. Let's see whether they're in Polish. They may not even exist in Poland. So, um, the most fundamental problem with evolution, however, is that it must assert that something comes from nothing. That a higher level of being comes from a lower level of being without a sufficient cause. For evolution unashamedly asserts that there is a gradual process from lower life forms to higher ones. 
But how does a lower life form generate a higher one without asserting that something more comes from something less? In other words, the higher perfections, the higher natures of the evolved life forms lack sufficient cause. You don't get something from nothing. But to assert that something can happen without a sufficient cause is to assert that something can come from nothing, which is utterly absurd. <clears throat> Although Darwinists and evolutionists in general are quick to put forth evidence which seems to be in their favor, they hide evidence which contradicts their theory. Where are, for example, the immediate species, in intermediate species between the ancient ones and the modern ones? Darwin himself said that the intermediate species between the ape and man had to exist in enormous numbers in preceding centuries. But where are they? To this day, they have not appeared in a clear and complete way. Uh, if you remember, I, there was a, a professor that said that, that he abandoned uh, evolutionism because after all this time, they have not found those species. It isn't there. Nor are the findings of primitive animals in Africa conclusive, for the reconstructions made of the few tiny bone parts are themselves gratuitous. They find a few bones. And then they construct this whole body around them. Furthermore, in these cases, there is no evidence of humans, that is, of beings with language, commerce, religion, laws, etc., but only of animals which look like apes. You have to have evidence of human beings. So there is no evidence to say that there were anything else than apes, perhaps a species which became extinct for one reason or another. So they might find something that no longer is around. A lot of beings go out of existence for one reason or another. Darwinism and evolutionism in general is opposed to Catholic doctrine. It is a faith to say that God is the creator of heaven and earth and of all things that are in them. Darwinism denies this or must deny it since it posits, posits as the cause of species natural selection, which, as, as we have seen, is not a sufficient cause of alteration of species. What is not against the faith in Darwinism are the facts and phenomena which have been accurately observed. We can even say that the idea of the development of different subspecies within the same species based on accidental differences is not against the faith and may even be true, what we already said. What is against the faith in Darwinism is its atheistic and materialistic applications. <clears throat> Now, Heckel, Heckel is actually worse than Darwin, uh, but he's not as well known. But he actually was more radical than Darwin. Ernst Heckel, German biologist, was born in Potsdam. That's near Berlin, uh, location of the famous uh, palace of the German Kaisers called Sans Souci. Um, and okay, a uh, place where the post-war. Uh, oh, you have a, a question? Yes. What's your question? If I understand correctly, your question is, is God still creating? He could. It's, there's nothing, he can do whatever he wants. Uh, but that's not evolutionism, nor is it revealed. So 
but speculatively, yes, he could. And you could have, that would be a sufficient cause. As he could take a frog and change a frog into a prince. He could take uh, any, any animal at all and change it into something higher. That's creation. That involves creation. So it's not impossible that God do that, except that we don't know that he does, and there's really no evidence that he does. So it would, that would not contradict the faith. It you know, would be a, an odd theory, but it would not contradict the faith. All right. Okay. So Potsdam uh, is also the place where, uh, after the war, Stalin, Truman, and uh, Churchill met uh, in, uh, I think it was July, it was shortly before the atomic bomb, because Truman told Stalin, I have an atomic bomb, and Stalin was not at all surprised, because he knew. All right, anyway. He studied medicine and science at Würzburg, Berlin, and Vienna, having for his masters such men as Johannes Müller, uh, or uh, Winchow, and uh, Kölliker, and in 1857 graduated at Berlin as MD and uh, M, whatever, probably chemistry. At the wish of his father, he began to practice as a doctor in that city, but his patients were few in number, one reason being that he did not wish them to be uh, many, and after a short, short time, he turned to more congenial pursuits. In 1861, at the instance of Karl Gegenbauer, which means against the tree, uh, he uh, became, no, Gegen, uh, Bauer is a farmer. I'm Bauer, yeah. Baum is, yes. So Gegen, that means against the farmer. He became privatdozent, that means a, a uh, private tutor at Jena, of course, which is the pit of all evil. Uh, in the succeeding year, he was chosen extraordinary professor of comparative anatomy and director of the Zoological Institute in the same university. In 1865, he was appointed to a chair of zoology, and that is not zoology, it's zoology. Do not say zoology, zoology, uh, which was specially established for his benefit. This last position he retained for 43 years in spite of repeated invitations to migrate to more important centers such as Strasbourg or Vienna. And at Jena, he spent his life with the exception of the time he devoted to traveling in various parts of the world from which he in every case, uh, which from which in every case he brought back a rich zoological harvest. So that's from that Encyclopedia of Philosophy. I forget the name of it. Ernst Haeckel represents radical Darwinism. Although Darwin presupposed the creation of a, an original life form, Haeckel says that this is an arbitrary and illogical limitation in the series of causes. Heckel also asserts logically that the same protoplasm serves as the origin of both vegetal and animal life. He even says that there must be a kingdom in between plants and animals, something that is neither plant nor animal, but something else. Heckel says that there was a primordial material mass, which was the result of diverse chemical combinations. Where did the chemicals come from? By means of condensation and multiplication, here's more science as we go, it gives rise to rudimentary plant and animal forms. See, so plant and animals are merely the result of chemistry. That if you get enough chemicals together in the right situation, uh, poof, you have life. By natural selection, these rudimentary life forms gradually progressed into species. Matter, writes Heckel, and the quantity of force which is inseparable from it are unlim unlimited in time and in space. They are eternal and infinite. The history of the world is nothing else than a physiochemical process, and in its turn the soul is the sum of the phenomena of the molecular movements. So we are just a bag of chemicals. Nicely arranged.
It is a great triumph for modern biology to have reduced the miracle of vital phenomena to material elements, to have demonstrated that the physical and chemical properties, infinitely varied and complex, of the albuminoid bodies are the essential causes of organic and vital phenomena. It is true that the soul needs a, a very complex chemical structure in order that the, the matter be conformed to the soul. And that's why you die when that complex chemical structure stops functioning, particularly in your heart or your brain. Okay? That's when things start to break down. That's why you die. Because the form is no longer, and form and matter are no longer coordinated. That's why you feel good when you're young and you feel rotten when you get old. Because of the breakdown of the matter, not the breakdown of the soul. The soul is fine. It's the breakdown of the matter. So he's confusing the, the material structures that are demanded for life with life itself. Heckel unabashedly asserts that there is a greater difference between the large monkeys and the small monkeys than there is between the large monkeys and man. All right. Heckel and his followers never cease to attack religion the immortality of the soul, the future life, human liberty, and the notion of a personal God. He referred to God as only a gaseous vertebrate. So he makes Darwin look like, you know, he's on his knees praying the rosary. Heckel was really bad. Now watch this. Heckel was well known to have falsified evidence. This is well known. This is not any, you know, conspiracy theory. He was openly accused of it by other scientists. He ultimately admitted it. Six or eight percent, he said, of my drawings of embryos are really falsified. We are obliged to fill the vacancies with hypotheses. So he did these drawings of embryos, how they develop, you know. He, he admits six to eight percent. Who knows? What, you know. It's like Luther falsifying the epistle of Romans. Who admitted it? He admitted it. Faith alone. Because there was no place in all sacred scripture that said faith alone. And he needed that. So he put it in, in the, in the German translation. And admitted it. Because that's what St. Paul meant, he said. All right. Are we going for time? All right, so th that's obviously very important because it influences uh, so many, so much thought and attitude today. I mean, it's it's like a dogma. The modern world, and it's based on garbage. Ontologism. Ontologism in general. It is the error asserting that the cognition of our intellect begins with the immediate and intuitive vision of God. So they say we have, we have a, an immediate and intuitive vision of God in our minds. Maybe they do, but I don't. All right? They say that God, who is the f first in the order of being, is also first in the order of cognition. Their axiom is primum ontologicum as primum logicum. The first ontological thing is the first logical thing. Which sounds good, but it, it's, as, it's as phony as a $3 bill. As a matter of fact, the first ontological thing is the last logical thing. The name was thought up by Gioberti, but the error is old. Gioberti was a priest uh, who was uh, an Italian revolutionist and also predicted the Novus Ordo. The, he lived in the 1850s. Transformation of Catholicism. That's done in another course. 
There are four types of ontologism. One is pan. Did you have a question? Well, the first ontological thing is God. He's the highest being. Ons ontos in Greek. Have you taken any Greek yet? No. On. That looks like O N. The ontos. Uh, that's the genitive. Means being. You see it on icons where you have Christ and you have Ho at the top. They usually don't put the uh, Ho. That's it. Ho. And then you have the Omega over here. And then here you have, that's the capital N. Ho on. That means being itself. And Christ is in the middle. That's in his halo. Ho on. Being his divinity. See, so that the first ontological thing, the first being is God. The first logical thing is the, uh, the first principles of reason. Right? But in, that, in our course of knowledge, we learn the existence of God at the end, not at the beginning. In other words, we learn the existence of God from creatures. So that's the last logical thing. See, anything to do with logic, logos means word, so anything to do with logic is your mind. Anything to do with own or being is outside of your mind. See, so that's subject-object, as always. See? So the, they're saying the first ontological thing, God is the first logical thing. So we know God first, and then we know everything else, which is just not true. I mean, it doesn't conform to common experience. And whenever any philosophical system does not conform to common experience, it is wrong. Philosophy is meant to explain the common experience. If it doesn't conform to that, it's trash. It's somebody's imagination. So right away, they're idiots. All right, so pantheistic ontologism, two, rationalistic ontologism, three, the ontologism of Malbranche, and four, moderate ontologism. Pantheistic ontologism identifies God with our intellect. This is a monstrous error. Rationalistic ontologism makes a distinction between our reason and God, but says that reason is capable, that it even has uh, the natural capacity of penetrating directly the nature of God. This leads to pantheism, since all, the only intellect which can penetrate into the infinite nature of God is the divine intellect itself. Malebranche, a disciple of Descartes, taught that the first thing that we intuit is God, that all singular things are intuited in him. For him, the divine essence can be considered in two ways, one, as it is in itself, and two, as it is in relation to creatures, where it is the archetype of created things. In this second way, does the intellect, according to Malbranche, perceive the essence of God? Moderate ontologism is that of Gilberti, and you'll study that in another, it's not very important, in another course. So that, that's, uh, it's, it's important because the modernists are going to say that we have an interior experience of God. This, this idea of, and that, that dogma comes from this interior experience of God that everyone has. So it's, it's related to ontologism. All right. <clears throat> 